record. Okay. Okay. So now the recording's on. So sorry about that. We already prayed. So anybody watching the recording, you can offer a short prayer. I forgot to record the prayer. Um, so in studying Nashville, I've thought about, you know, how to present it. And I, really, basically, we should just go back uh, to, to some other points uh, that are quite important. It's not just about reading the, the statements about Nashville. It's understanding about what this message is about. So we know that this is a message of, that the priests are giving and that this, that this event is supposed to be the catalyst uh, to reach the Levites. So, so to reach Seventh-day Adventists who have been questioning, who, have, who are in confusion regarding all the different information out there. Now, really where we start is Acts chapter 27. Uh, so we're going to go there. And I'm going to do like a really quick study on Acts 27. As soon as I create so I can share. Yeah. Now, many of us are familiar with some of the details of Acts chapter 27. We know that Paul is being brought to Rome, and uh, he's traveling with Luke and Aristarchus. And uh, in, this, in this trip, they start out, uh, it talks about all the different places they have. There's importance dealing with the name of the ship and all these things. I'm not going to go through all those things. Uh, you know, they get on a ship of Alexandria. There's lots of symbolism uh, that we can use. I, I really don't want to focus on all of those things because uh, that would be a long study. So this is just a really uh, quick study on, on Acts 27. Um, where I, I want to start is, is really their location and the storm. So, um, so they come... In, in Acts 27, 7, it says, When they had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Sal Salmoni. And hardly passing, it came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lacia. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I per perceive that this voyage will be with, with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So Paul is just giving some common sense advice here. Uh, this is in the fall. So uh, it's about the time of the autumnal equinox, uh, because we know that the fast there, that's referring to the Day of Atonement. And also, that's not really a very good time to travel in the Mediterranean. So Paul's just giving basic advice, um, uh, but it's being ignored by uh, the people involved, the people in charge. Uh, it says in verse 11, uh, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, and the more part advised to depart, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. So, so they're they wanting to go, they came to this, this place, Fair Havens, but they want to get to this other haven of Crete, and so that's their their plan. Now they get into this storm. And there's lots of symbolism here. I'm not going to go into this whole idea of what's happening in this storm, but there is this storm. It's a wind called the Euroclidon, um, which, you know, some translations say it was like an, uh, a northeast wind. It's actually probably more a Levanter, so it's a wind that can constantly change its directions, uh, which would be a very dif difficult wind uh, to work with if you're trying to get anywhere. Um, and also very strong wind. So it'd be a hurricane type wind. Now they um, get into a lot of trouble. Um, they start 
lessening the load on on the ship uh, and uh, let me see here we get to so it says in 2727 but when the 14th night was come as it were we were driven up and down in Adra about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country and uh, there's also earlier uh, that Paul was um, told that there would be no loss of life on the ship, which he encouraged them. So here anyway, in verse 27, uh, they come to this, this idea that land is near. And so what they do is they sound uh, to try to figure out how deep the water is. It tells them if they're near shore. And of course, some of you know that uh, they sound and find 20 fathoms and they've gone a little further and they sounded again and found 15 fathoms. Now, these numbers, uh, 20 fathoms and 15 fathoms, if you take fathoms as inches, you would have um, uh, 100 and, uh, 1,440 uh, inches in 20 fathoms and uh, 1,080 in 15 fathoms. And if you add them together, you get um, 25, 20 fathoms. So it's, it's, you know, it's quite, you know, it's one of those things that we use that has the 2520 here. Um, now, of course, that's not really the main point. It's just, I like bringing up things like that. The main point has to do with uh, the number of people on the ship. So we know that there's the shipwreck and that there's 270, uh, pe 76 people on the ship. And the way that we understood this is that there's, and it's in verse 37, and we were all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. So that's the main point that we're looking at here is, is this number. And, and the other area that we have to deal with has to do with this other paper that I'm gonna bring up. Um, it's not this one, it's the other one. Um, so this is a paper by, um, Odilio, and he's going to talk about what Ellen White says about this. <clears throat> uh, and this is the latitude. So this is from the life of Paul. And I'm going to blow this up a little bit. It's too tiny. Hopefully people can see that. Uh, the centurion decided to follow the judgment of the majority. Accordingly, when the south wind blew softly, they set sail from Fair Havens with the flattering prospect that in a few hours would bring them to the desired harbor. All were now rejoicing that they had not followed the advice of Paul, but their hopes were destined to be speedily disappointed. They had not proceeded far when a tempestuous wind, uh, such as in that latitude, often succeeds the blowing of the south wind. So, uh, so it's interesting here that she talks about this, this wind uh, that uh, often succeeds or comes before the blowing of the south wind. Now, um, you can see here, if you're looking at the notes, that uh, raffia is placed there uh, by Odilio. I'm not sure if I would necessarily agree with that interpretation of it. But anyway, uh, but it burst upon them with merciless fury. From the first moment that the wind struck the vessel, its condition was hopeless. So sudden was the blow that the sailors had not a moment in which to prepare, and they could only leave the ship to the mercy of the tempest. So we can see here that uh, she talks about this wind, but the most important point here has to do with this latitude. So there's a number of different things, and, and, and I've never really presented on Nashville before on, on some of these reasons. Um, but he, he makes a note here regarding this latitude um, that it's um, the same latitude where they're going to actually have the ship land, the Isle of Malta. And it's the same latitude as Nashville and even Oak Ridge. So we're going to look at this. So we're dealing here with these, this idea of, of the connection of, of a map with uh, at least that's how we would think of it, a map or a globe or Google Earth. Um, but these degrees, latitude, and we're also going to see that longitude 
has a part to play as well. And, and this was done in, in, in nailing it down that it's the Parthenon, even though we had already chosen the Parthenon because of Ellen White's vision, which we're gonna go into, uh, we're gonna see that this idea of this latitude. Now, you know, I probably should tell the story a little bit more about how this came about. So uh, Odilio, even before we had Nashville as a target, was already looking at this statement regarding the latitude. And he started to look at cities that lay on that latitude. He never considered Nashville. Um, he just didn't know about it, I guess. So he had asked me, where, you know, where do you think that this attack is going to occur? And I said, Nashville. And, and he thought I had done a whole study on it and I must know something, but actually it just came into my mind. And, and that's just because I knew that there was something about Ellen White having a vision in Nashville where there was balls of fire. And that's all I knew at that time. So, so he right away already had this idea. And so when he looked at it and he saw that Nashville was also on that latitude, as well as Oak Ridge, and Oak Ridge is the place where the nuclear bomb, that's where the Manhattan Project was, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, that's where they were developed. So, so there's reasons why uh, we would then look at Nashville. One is the connection with the nuclear weapons and also with this idea of this latitude. And, and the word latitude is here in connection with the area. Uh, it's not something, when you're using the word latitude in the context that Ellen White's talking about, it's what we call latitude. It has to do with uh, where you are north and south. Now, um, I'm gonna bring up Google Earth so you can see this. Okay, so I just zoomed out of Nashville. Now when I draw a line uh, between these two places, between Malta and Nashville on Google Earth, it's not gonna go straight across because it's always gonna take the shortest route. And the shortest route is not finding the line, following the lines of latitude. So this line doesn't go in the direction we would like it to go if we were doing that. And if I drew a, drew a triangle though, it would end up, I think, uh, matching. So here's the island of Malta. It's just this little tiny island and uh, it would have been over here uh, somewhere that they probably would have landed. Now, the, the, if I was going to go to 36 degrees latitude, uh, that would bring me right, that would be dead on 36 degrees latitude uh, right there. So just kind of in the, the middle of these two bigger parts of the island. And so when I go over to the, the Parthenon, over to Nashville, uh, we're gonna see that, um, oops, I ended up hitting that. I, some advertising or something there we go it's got to load again it'll go just back to where we were um, and uh, I have a new microphone hopefully people can hear me well uh, I had the red light flashing I might have had the volume too high And so right over here, here's the Parthenon. Now yeah, my line disappeared. Um, now, some, some people have pointed out the steps here are uh, 36 degrees um, and nine minutes. So that's three, six, nine. So this is the number that, uh, or the series of numbers that we find in the scriptures, uh, the sixth and the ninth hour, but we also have the third hour, 
And of course we have the 12th hour. So the third, sixth, ninth, and 12th hour. And, and Stephen has done studies on these. Um, so that was thought significant. Now that of course is the same latitude. Now we also have um, another interesting phenomenon and that is if we look at the, um, <clears throat> the longitude, uh, the longitude is 86 uh, degrees. Um, so we know that this is, is from the Isle of, of Malta that, that we have this latitude. But when it comes to 86 degrees, uh, this 86 degrees is what we would call 86 degrees west. And that's from uh, uh, Greenwich line, right? So that's from zero degrees. Now, if I take, um, now it's 86 degrees and a half. So I'm just gonna do it this way, 86.5 roughly, 86 and a half degrees west. And I'm gonna take 360 degrees and subtract this. And what I would get is this number. So if I was to go east from Greenwich Mean Time and go around, I would end up coming to, to, to uh, 273 degrees east. And this number is this number that we look at in Acts. So we're gonna go back to Acts. Now, so many of you know what this is already, but I want to just uh, show why I think uh, Nashville is the target and the significance of that. So if we go back to Acts and we look at uh, this number that we had, uh, three, 203 score and 16 souls. So we have this number, and I think I actually, all this stuff I drew, you didn't see because uh, I didn't. So we have this number, uh, 276 people on, on the ship. And we're gonna take three of them out. Now, in, in trying to do that, there is a precedent uh, that many people don't know about. Uh, the argument that was made initially was just that these are Christians and the 273 aren't. So these are priests and these are Levites, uh, the two different groups. Now, if we go to Numbers chapter three, we also have this 273 show up. And, and, and the reason why I brought up the 2520 is we actually have a representation of the 2520 also in Acts chapter 3. So I'm going to establish this 273 a little bit more clearly and what it's connected to. So let's go back to Numbers. We're going to go this time to Numbers chapter 3. And this is, so what's happening in Numbers chapter three is the Levites are going to take over the role of the firstborn son. The firstborn son is the priest, also the leader, and also has the double portion. So those are all being distributed among the 12 tribes. So the double portion, of course, went to Joseph. He had Ephraim and Manasseh each become a tribe. We know the kingship goes to Judah, uh, but the priesthood, goes to Levi. And there's actually 13 tribes, though Levi is mixed among all the different tribes. So it doesn't have its own territory. It just has cities of the Levites that are scattered throughout Israel. Um, but in order to do this, God is setting up this <clears throat> exchange and he counts all of the firstborn of Israel. And uh, that number that they have is... Uh, I'm just writing it here. You won't be able to see it yet. Uh, it's 20. I don't think it's 27. 22,273. That's right. So you'll see this here. And uh, when you read through this passage, and if you want to do the math, you can, but you'll see that they're going to count all of the, the sons of, of, of the Levites. So, there's actually three different groups. There's um, uh, uh, 
uh, Kohath, Morari, and Gershon. And these are the three sons of Levi. And then they're going to count all of the, all of the children, all of the male children who are a month old and upward. And they're, they're going to count the number. Now, they don't give you the total, but if you count up uh, the numbers that are given, you'll find that the number is going to be, and of course, I'm writing in here and you can't see it yet, but it's going to be 22,300. And, and then there's going to be, if you read further, um, so it's the redemption of the firstborn. So what ends up happening is there's, they're going to count instead of 22,300, they're going to, they're going to say that the number of the firstborn or the number of the, the sons of the Levites is going to be 22,000. They're going to subtract this 300 out of it. And in their calculation, they're going to use 22,000. So they're not going to count this 300. Now, there's a lot of speculation of what this 300 represent, but these are all the sons, these are all Levites, and the suggestion is that these 300 could be people who are serving as priests, and that's why they're not counted. There's other theories about it. Some people say there's a typo, um, that, you know, one of the mistakes in, in one of the totals, uh, but I think it's pretty clear that there's 300 being taken out. So you can see uh, we have here a three being taken out, and here you can see we have a 300 being taken out. And of course, this would represent Gideon's 300. Uh, there's lots of symbolized symbols that come from that. Um, but to me, the main parallel here is this three and this 300 that are being taken out of these numbers. Now, so the difference then between uh, the firstborn of the children of Israel and the sons of, the, of Levi are going to be 273. So that's where they're going to give that number, 273. And then they're going to have to be redeemed. So if you read in the passage, it says that they have to pay five shekels for each of these. Um, and so that number comes to, because if you multiply that by five, you get 1,365 shekels. And this is, uh, in this passage here, when you deal with these shekels, um, this number here doesn't look very significant, but remember, we have 13 tribes. Levi is one of the tribes, but Levi is, is going to be taken out and spread among them. Now, if you, if you look at, uh, at, at this number here and you divided it by 13, so we're going to divide it by 13, you would actually get 105. And if you take 105, if you take Levi out of this, you get the number 1260. So in both stories, the story in Acts 27, we end up with the number 273. We end up with a representation of the 2520. Here it's half of it. In, in, in the other story, it's the actual 2520. And then we also have this symbol of three whether it's three or 300, we have those. So we have all of these symbols in both of these accounts, one in the New Testament, one in the Old Testament. Now, the significance then of 273, as we know, it's about the number of the Levites. But now we can go to Acts 27, and we can see that Acts 27 leads us to, to Nashville because it's on the same latitude. Now, we can also deal with the symbolism of the wind, uh, the wind is obviously coming from the east, a little bit from the north, maybe even from the southeast, but it's not a west wind. It's an east wind, an eastern hurricane, which of course would symbolize Islam. And then you have this 273 number plus the latitude. Um, to me, this would, this would give us an indication both to the longitude, uh, that is the direction east and west, and also to the latitude the direction north and south. And so those coordinates come together at the, at the steps of the Parthenon Temple in Nashville. So to me, there would be a lot of reasons why I would choose Nashville based on this evidence. And of course, the number 273, if you take the number 273 
and you represent it. Here, I need to turn off this so people can see this. People need to stop me sometimes. Um, so if I take this number 273, and I represent it here as a base 10 number, because that's normally what we think of numbers, base 10. Um, but I'm going to take the number of the priests, which is the number 8, and I'm going to represent this number as base 8. The number that I would get is 187. So these two numbers equal each other. 273 is base 10, and 187 is base 8. So this to me was a question I asked, actually, um, I noticed when um, in the email where I got this Nashville paper um, from Odilio, I then noticed this and sent an email regarding it. I said, hey, did anybody ever notice this? And of course, nobody had because we hadn't been doing anything like this before. So now we know that there's all kinds of numbers that represent each other. Um, we know if we take the number uh, 187 and we do it as a base 16, I think it is, or 32, we get the number 88. And if we take the number 391, uh, we get uh, 264, which is the 26th day of the fourth month. So I could do 391 and I, I do it as a base 10, but it's going to equal 264 as a base 16, I believe. And then if I take the number, I think it's the number 187. I could be wrong. It could have been 264. People need to look this up. I just can't remember. And this would be 88 in a base 32, I believe. But I think maybe it was 264. But anyway, I can't remember. But we have, anyway, these two I'm pretty sure of. This one, I can't remember how that worked. And 88, of course, is a symbol of uh, the priests and the Levites comes from Second Chronicles chapter 2, and it's been a number that Jeff has been using for a long time. Um, so anyway, we have these symbols here dealing with Nashville, and we're going to see that some of these symbols show up again as well. Now, we've mostly focused upon the visions of Ellen White, and of course that's where I started, was just I knew Ellen White had a vision about Nashville being hit by a fireball. And if you go to a book called The Great Visions of Ellen G. White, which you can find on your CD-ROM or online at the Ellen G. White Estates, um, they actually suggest uh, in the Nashville Visions uh, that it's a nuclear uh, or thermonuclear device uh, that Ellen White is witnessing based upon the description of it. And one of the things is that the light, the flashes of light, that Ellen White sees causes bu buildings to be instantly disintegrated, to catch on fire, which is something that you see in a thermonuclear explosion. The temperatures, the light itself creates fires, where normally we think of heat creating fires. But in, in a thermonuclear explosion, it's the light that does it. And, and that's an interesting uh, characteristic that Ellen White has in these visions. Now, we're going to look at uh, the visions themselves here uh, just briefly. We're not going to go into them extensively. And as I said, this was a paper that, uh, you know, Odili had, had prepared shortly after I talked to him about Nashville. So uh, the first one is Manuscript 188-1905. Uh, Ellen White says, now this is, uh, I believe, was notes that were taken. Um, she didn't write this out, um, but she's, so I got to share it on the screen. She says, when I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. Is this, it is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, said they. 
You knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us? They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they had never told them or given them any warning at all. And of course, this is the settled in Nashville quote. Um, it's interesting that Steve Wahlberg on uh, Fulcrum 7 writes an article and, and he makes it an observation which is, is sort of a veiled criticism that Ellen White didn't actually write this, which I don't think is relevant at all. Um, his argument is, well, she didn't write it because she didn't really want people to know about it. But of course, in God's providence, we know about this and we know about it at, in time for July 18th, 2020. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had access to this manuscript. Um, we had other uh, manuscripts uh, which were referencing Nashville, but we didn't have this one. And so, you know, he sort of argues, well, it's not really very important. She wasn't wanting people to, to alarm anybody uh, with this, with this um, warning. And of course, in her day, it would have been too soon. So obviously God has his timing. Um, now, Adilio is going to analyze it um, at that time with the understanding that he has uh, about what was going on. And at that time, uh, this, when he gave me this paper, uh, the July 18, 2020 uh, prediction was not being accepted. So he has a lot of speculation about what that means in the context of, of this um, prediction. So, you know, a lot of it just doesn't really apply. But at that time, he was trying to figure out, is the movement even going to accept the July 18, 2020 prediction? Now we have uh, another one. Uh, this is manuscript 102, 1904. Yeah. I think Chris, get your attention. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. I, I had an interesting point I was wondering about if anybody had any input on when it says it settled into Nashville. I know that her language and, and language of the day was a little different than what we okay. have today for sure, but what, what did what is your take on that term settled into Nashville? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, I think the language is a little bit different because we think of settling as something that um, like coming down gently. And, uh, but I just think that that's just an expression that they would have. It, it hit Nashville. You know, that's where it went. The fall of fire, fall of fire settled in Nashville. That's yeah. just describing the location, but that, but it's a good point. Yeah. Because we wouldn't, we wouldn't talk that way nowadays. We wouldn't say it settled, you know. Well, it almost sounds like it just like, you know, slowly settled down into Nashville. And I thought, well, that, that's really kind of strange. But, you know, maybe in that day, uh, settled just means that's where it landed. Yeah. 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 They, they often say the ship, you know, settled in some place when it settled on some rocks. It doesn't necessarily mean it was nice and uh, easy, uh, just an expression. Uh, at least that's the way I would take it because I read a lot of old books and, and that's kind of how they speak. Yeah, so, so the, the fireball hit Nashville. Uh, so it didn't really settle down gently. Okay, so uh, we have this other quote. Last night a scene was presented before me. I may never feel free to reveal all of it, but I will reveal a little. It seemed that an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed large houses. From place to place rose the cry, the Lord has come, the Lord has come. Many were unprepared to meet him, but a few were saying, because we now see what we have been looking for, if, we, if you believe that these things were coming, why did you not tell us, was the terrible response. We did not know about these things. Why did you leave us in ignorance? Again and again, you have seen us. Why did you not become acquainted with us and tell us of the judgment to come, and that we must serve God lest we perished? Now we are lost. Now, of course, people believe it's the second coming, but we know that can't be the second coming because this would be a completely different uh, conversation after the seven last plagues, after the voice from heaven is, is announced to Christ's return. So this has to be events uh, that actually are preceding the close of probation, uh, not events that are connected with the seven, second coming, which some people try to argue, uh, at least online, Oh, that that's just talking about when Jesus comes back, but that's not what you would have happening in that context. Um, now, 
this is a manuscript, or it's a letter, 1904. She says, the night before last, a very impressive scene passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire into the midst of some beautiful mansions causing their instant destruction. Uh, so ball of fire fall into the midst of some beautiful mansions causing their instant destruction. I heard some say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but why did that you, but we did not know they would come so soon. Others said, you knew. Why then did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side, I heard such words spoken. So of course, this was this idea that, um, you know, people need to be warned. And, and many Adventists know about this, uh, but didn't tell people about it because they themselves didn't know it was going to be so soon. Even if they had heard about the July 18 prediction, uh, they would just think, oh, this is something that's going to happen later. So, so they, they obviously knew. So that's the way that I would take this quote. Now, this to me is the, uh, this is the first vision that's being talked about in this next quote. Uh, the first vision was um, um, in, in July. Oh, I'm trying to think if it was July. The date was. I should know these things. They don't give the date here. But it was in July of 1904. And then her other visions, some of these were later on in, in 1906. So this is really the first one. Uh, she says, there was a scene presented to me. It was the night before the Sabbath, so that'd be Friday night. That is when that scene was presented. I looked out the window. Now, we know she was in Nashville here. Uh, she actually presents this on the Tuesday after she has the vision um, to uh, a group of people in a, in a meeting. She presents this. And there was an immense ball of fire that had come from heaven, and it fell where they were casting buildings with pillars. Especially the pillars were presented to me. And it seemed as if the ball came right to the building and crushed it. And they saw that it was branching out, branching out, enlarging. And they began to cry and mourn and mourn and wring their hands. And I thought some of our people stood by there saying, well, it is just what we have been expecting. It is just what we have been talking about. So people are just talking about this, right? It's not something that's not being talked about. And we know now it is being talked about amongst Seventh-day Adventists in a large way, all kinds of videos by different groups of people and lots of discussion on the internet uh, regarding this. It is just what we've been talking about. People said, you knew it? You knew it and never told us about it? I thought there was such an agony in their face, such an agony in their appearance. Now, of course, one of the things that's interesting here is this repetition, the doublings that occur in this statement, uh, which would indicate it's the midnight cry. Now, I think some of her other statements, even though they talk about balls of fire, are not necessarily talking about Nashville. Uh, we know that judgments come upon other cities as well. The interesting thing about this quote, and I'm going to uh, find it here in Andrew Wiper's writings, and it's right here. It's just, it's kind of small. I don't know how to make the print bigger. Um, it's in the next scene, I was in a room where there was a company sitting around as we are here and there was one of authority that stood there and he had maps and he took the map and he put it into the hands of one and had him look at it. And there were f little fine rays of light from heaven that seemed to be coming down. So I think it's interesting here uh, that we have these maps being mentioned. Now, of course, here they're not dealing with the uh, longitude and latitude of uh, of the vision or anything or of the location of Nashville. But I think it's just interesting that you have these maps right away, uh, um, right after that vision being presented. Now I'm going to jump to other things. So that's basically the, the statements and, and we all know of these statements. Now this is a study that was done in 2017. So this was Pat Rampey who did this study and a, and a lady. Uh, her name's on the paper. You'll see that there if you look at it. And they were already considering uh, when this event was going to occur. So I find that interesting that Pat Rampey was trying to figure out which year uh, Nashville was going to be hit by this fireball in 2017. 
So very, very interesting to me. The year is important, um, but also the fact that they were looking at the future. And they were making this argument based upon seven years and the 49th year. And, and, and so they were trying to go from uh, two different events that they chose that they wanted to count the number of years. Now, the first one is very interesting. Uh, it's October 8th, 19, 1895, that the National, Nashville Parthenon cornerstone is laid with a formal dedication. So you can see this on, uh, on, on a site dealing with uh, all this history of the Parthenon. Uh, that date is very interesting. So October 8th is interesting. Um, you know, in and of itself, there's some symbolism there with the number eight. And October, even though it's the 10th month, originally was the eighth month. And so you can have a doubling of 8-8. Eight, eight. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting is that uh, if you look at the biblical calendar, this is the 18th day of the seventh month. So, so it's not just that it's, we have the symbolism in the, Jew, in the Gregorian date, but we also have the symbolism in uh, uh, the biblical date. Now, I just want to go over to my uh, program here, my base converter, because I need to do this here for my own uh, interest again. So I think it, I'm just going to check these numbers. Uh, which number goes to 88? And this is going to be, okay, so that's not, so this would be 264. I think it's the number 264. Yeah, so it's the number 264 that if I put it in as base 10, uh, it, and I convert it to base 32, I get 88. And I'll just show you these other numbers. So if I put in 391, and I'm going to do that as base 16. So that's half, again, as much. And that's going to be 187, you see there. And then when I take, uh, I erase those numbers there. So, And then if I take the number 187, there we go. and I put it into base 8, and I convert that, that's number 273. So hopefully you can see that there on it. So. So we get this numbers, this 88 and, one, and, and this 18th day of the seventh month uh, in that symbolism of the laying of the cornerstone. Now, they, now, what they did is they counted 126 years and they came to the year 2021. And they're saying, is this the year Ellen G. White's Nashville vision is fulfilled? So they were just speculating on this based on just a simple counting of 126 years. Now, the other date that we have is the Nashville Day Parthenon open to the public, September 11th, 1897. So, uh, so we have another symbolic date, 9-11, and, and from there they count 126 years and they say, is it 2023, you know, or is this the year, right? So they're doing some speculation there. The thing that's interesting is if you counted, uh, instead of cardinally, but ordinally, uh, you would come to 2020 with this first one. That is, you could take the biblical date, 18th day of the seventh month, and you could count uh, with 1895 as zero, you would get 2021. But if you counted it as the first year of 126 years, you would end up with 2020. So it's interesting that the Gregorian date is July 18th, 2020, 126 uh, ordinal years from uh, 1895. So, so there's just things like this that become a little bit, uh, yeah, as somebody said here, a bit freaky. So obviously, these are not just normal coincidences uh, because we have a multitude of them. And, and of course, we have also, the fact that we predicted July 18th, 2020, based upon the 264, this is the 26th day of the fourth month, and we used Josiah Litch's prophecy, and so we used all these arguments, and they're very, very sound. So it, it becomes very difficult to say we could be wrong. But of course, we know we could be wrong in some way. What way we're wrong, that we don't know. But 
all we know is that all the evidence continues to point to Nashville. Um, and he's even going to have some stuff in his paper about uh, time setting where they're going. And this was done December 1st, 2017. Uh, somebody named LJN is their initials. LJN 1844 Gmail is their email if you want to email them. Whoever that is, it probably says some, I, I think he says in his email, he tells me who it was, but I don't think it says in the paper who it was. Um, so there's, it's, it's an interesting study to look at what somebody was doing in 2017 in, in regard to Nashville, uh, based upon the 2520. So I know it's a little bit of a scattered study. It's not, it's not as organized as most of the things that I present. Um, but I, I want to, um, you know, I, I want to just sort of sum it up. This is not, you know, a, a big study. Um, but also I want other people to sort of weigh in on, on some of the other evidences that I've left out. But even if we look at this period of time here, if we go from this date, October 8th, which is uh, the 18th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar, and we go here to July 18th, which is the 26th day of the fourth month. Um, and we see that we've already connected all these different numbers together just with these base numbers. Uh, we also have the 391 in there. But we have this 126 years. And so we're going to call it 126 years. Okay, I see what you're saying. 26 day, fourth month, uh, fourth month. So we have these two symbols. Now, I just looked at this today. I haven't counted the number of days. I bet there's probably some significance in there because I always find that there is. But we can see here that this is the laying of the, found, the cornerstone of the Parthenon Temple. Now, I'm not sure exactly where the cornerstone is in the building, like which corner it is. Um, but this would definitely be, uh, you know, one of the corners of the building. And, you know, if it was the corner by where the, the, the steps are, it would be very close to ground zero. Um, so now we have Nashville. We have it connected. And just in summary, we have it connected uh, because it's 273 degrees east. And, of course, that's significant the symbol of Islam is east. We know it's also in the latitude of 36 degrees north and the tidings out of the north and the tidings out of the east. Um, and so this connects it with the story of, in Acts 27, which connects it to the 273. We also know that we have these dates. Um, we have September 11th, and we have October 8th, which is a symbol. This is 9-11. This is 88. And then we have this symbol, the 18th day of the seventh month, which we already understand is July 18th. So just these symbols, these to me are sort of objective um, facts that I can't interpret in any other way than to connect Nashville uh, to this, right? And of course, we also have the nine here, nine, 36 degrees and nine minutes, the three, six, nine. Um, so these are all symbols that point to uh, these way marks, to our lines. Um, I don't know, it just becomes, to me, pretty obvious that it must be Nashville that's going to be hit. But maybe there's things that we don't see, and that's always the problem when it comes to, uh, for me, as a human being, I know I can look at numbers and I can say, yes, all these things fit together, but I don't know what I don't know. And, and until, I, <laughs> until the event happens, I can't say with, I would say I'm 100% sure that everything points to Nashville on July 18th, 2020, being striked by a nuclear bomb uh, that comes from Islam. 
I'm 100% sure that all the evidence points to that, but I'm not 100% sure that I know enough uh, to say that it's going to happen 100%, right? So everybody understands that point. Now, one of the things that she talked about as far as the timing of this is the vision that she has when she's in Nashville. Um, and, and I need to look that vision up. I, I was going to look up the date of it. Um, yeah, so it was July 1st uh, that she had uh, the original vision. Because if I go to my, so it was on the 5th, uh, the Tuesday. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's close to the time that we're receiving all this light, uh, regarding Nashville. So it's not like in February or anything like that. It's in the month of July and we're in this 21 day period leading up to July 18th. And if I look at that date, uh, here in my calendar converter, um, so it's going to be July, uh, First, and I just got to go to 1904, and that's that's a Friday night. So that was the Friday night that she had this vision. And my my belief is that the event is going to occur Friday night. So, and and there's lots of reasons. So last week I did a study at Colin's place, and Colin convinced me that it has to be on July 18th and not some other date. That is, if the event does not occur on July 18th, I wouldn't then say, okay, maybe it's July 31st, which I used to say, well, maybe, you know, there's this span of time between these two dates, the 26th day of the fourth month and the 10th day of the fifth month. Um, but he convinced me, uh, there's a number of reasons. One of the reasons he used uh, was that if people are warned about this nuclear attack and they leave Nashville, you know, in response to this warning and it doesn't happen and they come back, but then they're destroyed two weeks later. That's kind of unfair, you know? So, so that's part of it. Um, but also as he, I started presenting the evidences to him, it seemed clear to me that there's really nothing pointing to another time or date, and especially the Friday night uh, before Sabbath, um, because that wouldn't apply if we were going to move it on uh, to uh, the next date. It would be a Friday, would be um, the 10th day of the fifth month, but that would be after the day is over from a biblical perspective if it's nighttime. So that would have been not actually the correct day at all. But that's me arguing from the point that I think that when she has the vision, that's the same time it happens. Um, so that would be my argument. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen on July 18th and it's going to happen Friday night. We won't have to wait around all day Sabbath, wondering when it's going to happen. Uh, it will already have happened. Um, so that Sabbath's going to be an interesting Sabbath, if I'm correct. Now, any thoughts on all this? Any evidences that I, I've neglected to bring up? Because I sort of threw them all at you. Not really a, a very organized study. But you can see that you know going to Acts 27 and then to uh, Numbers 3, I, t I really wanted to tie that uh, 273 in there. Uh, I do. Okay, so Chris, yep. Yeah, I had a couple of observations. Um, one was that the um, there was some of the other uh, manuscripts that talk about balls of fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they don't give Nashville as a location. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they talk about balls of fire. One mm -hmm. of the manuscripts also indicates that the people believed the judgments of God were coming, but they didn't realize they were coming so soon. Right. Which would indicate that there hadn't been judgments that they could identify from God prior. And these were the first ones they were seeing. Right. Which made me begin to wonder if maybe this is a period of time when um, not only maybe a nuclear but we may have balls of fire from other sources. Maybe this is a time period when the judgments get poured out, some of them. Yeah, well, and yeah, and there's, you know, some people think, well, this should be a meteor 
that's coming in order to look at it as the judgments of God. And, um, you know, so the idea, well, if it's a nuclear bomb, why would people consider it the judgments of God? But I would think that many people would consider it the judgments of God, even if it's a nuclear attack. Yeah. Um, because they would, they would recognize it, that that's what it is. This is not something uh, that uh, is, uh, is expected. They don't expect this to happen. So some people know that the judgments of God uh, are going to be uh, poured out upon the earth. But I think part of the, the thing here is, in this quote, the, the Nashville vision itself, the one that she has on July 1st, 1904, she only says a ball of fire. She doesn't say balls of fire. Right. Um, which I find interesting because originally I didn't, I didn't know that, um, that there was this distinction that there's these other visions. I just kind of thought it was one vision and she was talking about it, but we know that there was the other vision, which was August, uh, 24th, I think, uh, 1906, about two years later. I think that was the date. Um, could be wrong, but anyway, on that one, she was in, uh, in California and, you know, there's there's no real indication to me that that's actually talking about Nashville, that that I could see in the second vision. So we have the one Nashville vision. Um, in the other one, she says she doesn't know what city it is, but in the yeah. Nashville vision, we can see that it is Nashville, and she's in Nashville when she has it, and when she talks about it later on, she says the fireball settled in Nashville. So. So I think, you know, we need to re recognize that all, all these statements are talking about Nashville and we know that other cities will be hit. Um, so it could be though that they come in quick succession, that Nashville is just the first and maybe other places get hit, you know, within that day. So yeah. that, you know, you know, it's possible that there's some kind of an attack that occurs, uh, a coordinated attack by Islam and, you know, a lot of times people think that these are going to be, you know, huge missiles, like a, an atomic bomb. You know, my view is that this could be something, um, you know, I think because the ball of fire settles in Nashville, it hits Nashville, I would think that it's possible that it's, it's a small bomb, maybe in, in, there's airports near Nashville. I don't know if anybody knows all about Nashville. There's two airports. Um, you know, maybe it's, a, it's an airplane that has a nuclear device on it. There's just so many things we don't know about this. Yeah. Um, but in, in trying to, to picture what's going to happen, uh, we know that, you know, if we have a nuclear attack on the United States, things change. What's happening now, things change really quickly. There is not going to be, um, you know, I, and I don't know how they're going to change. I just know they're going to change. You know, whether it's going to create bigger divisions in the U.S., or whether they're going to pull together for a while and then create bigger divisions, or whether it's just uh, they pull together in some way, I don't know. But right now, what you see in the U.S. is pretty bizarre. And uh, yeah, so anybody else have any thoughts on that? Angela probably has thoughts. She usually does. Got some good insight for us, Angela? I don't know. I I tuned in late to begin with, so I'll have to watch this thing later. But in yeah. Deuteronomy 12.3, there's a lot of iconoclasm going on there. You shall overthrow their altars, break their pillars, burn their groves with fire, hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and so the thing that we haven't actually talked about is... Uh, which I was talking with Chris about before we started, uh, has to do with the symbolism regarding Nashville. So we know that she was in Nashville for the reason of doing the work in the South. And, and also she was in Nashville and many times uh, dealing with Madison College. Um, so, so there was this educational work, uh, which was to establish a, a college in the South that was going to follow the blueprint and not... Uh, and this, the only board she ever sat on was the Madison board. So uh, Ellen White had an interest in seeing a place. And when Madison College started, uh, the comment was that this just looks like a farm. It doesn't look like a school. And, uh, but that blueprint was never followed, really. It was for a time at Madison, but it slowly started to look like all the other colleges as time went on. And, and we also know that... Uh, the prejudice, there's a symbol in 
in the Nashville Parthenon that we're, we're not always aware of. That is, uh, the South set this up as, uh, had a lot to do with the prejudice towards the Blacks. Um, it, it was the South trying to take its stance that it was, that its society was a better society than the North and, and that they were going to be educated, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't something that was inclusive. It was something that was really exclusive. It was about making the South great again. <laughs> really, that's what it was about. Uh, that's what the, the Parthenon and, and the whole exhibit, the world, the world, the exposition that they had, I don't know if it's the world's ex, world's fair or whatever that they had there uh, was really to showcase that they were uh, they were on track, even though that they had all this prejudice. Uh, it was it was actually supporting that that idea of racial discrimination, and and this is well documented, uh, and the people who were involved in building the Parthenon. But of course, it was also education, Greek education. We have the symbolism, of course, with Athena, and and the Parthenon building itself, and. Um, so they're trying to establish themselves as a cultural center in the South based upon or patterned after Greek education. So we have all this symbolism regarding Nashville. Um, I know when Jeff was interviewed, the guy asked him, uh, is it because, you know, God doesn't like country music or something to that effect? Um, or there is, you know, so, I mean, obviously we know that there's lots of evil Country music, we may think, is not as bad as bad. as Hollywood, but it really, it's very, very bad. Music, Nashville, is a lot of evil, uh, just like Hollywood or other centers of entertainment. And so, um, you know, so there's also that judgment of God upon it. So there's just lots happening in the States now, too, that really, uh, Nashville has been in the news quite a bit, dealing with this, uh, the racial tensions that exist. Um, and of course, we know Nash Nashville recently, or the spring, got hit by a tornado, the second one. I've, I've done a study on that, on the timing of the tornado, compared to the one that had hit previously. Um, so, so we know that there's just lots happening in Nashville. Uh, you know, many people sort of mocked the idea that it would be Nashville. Uh, you know, wouldn't, go wouldn't this, these judgments, if they're coming from God, happen on New York City? you know, or LA or something or Hollywood. But, but I think there's a lot of symbolism there. And the question is, why would Islam choose Nashville? And, and I would think that if it's part of coordinated attacks, one thing we know about Islam is that they would see this as an attack upon the United States that's different than attacking New York. And maybe they would think that uh, this is going to be you know, a smaller target, but it's going to be symbolically uh, more, more important. Um, and it could be, you know, they read the newspapers and they saw that we predicted an attack on Nashville on July 18th. And they said, well, you know, maybe that's a good day and a good target. So, you know, it is possible that no, um, it becomes a prophecy that sort of uh, the target and the timing is determined by the fact that we made this prediction. And that would be something where the world could then say, and, and it, maybe even the people who did it could say, we chose that day because of these people. That would weaken for many, many people uh, the prophetic testimony that we have, even though it's solid. Uh, but to me, it would be a plan of, of, of Satan to undermine... Um, and I'm going to answer Larry here. So Larry, you have a comment on that. Um, I don't think, like if, if you remember after 9-11, one of the things that occurred in the Midwest, because mm -hmm. I live in the Midwest, I live yeah. two hours from Nashville. Mm -hmm. I grew up two hours from Nashville. Yeah. Um, people were so afraid that Islam was going to attack in some little podunk town in the middle of the Midwest somewhere. They were, everyone was totally afraid of this. Ridiculous. I mean, as it may sound, if they attacked the heartland of the United States, I don't think people understand how that would affect, like you expect LA, you expect Sacramento. 
San, yeah. San Francisco, you expect Seattle, New York, Boston. Yeah. But to hit somewhere like Nashville would have a direct strike at the heart of the United States that would affect people really a lot, I think. And I think Jeff has addressed it also in the, the sense of the true education, false education, yeah. as you talked about. Yeah, I understand that. The, the question that I have is, would the people ha doing the attack, would they understand that? That's sort of the, the problem. Like, yeah, we can see that, okay, this, is, this would make sense. But, you know, they would have to also see that it would make sense. I think part of it, too, is, is if you think about how God used kingdoms mm -hmm. to deal with other kingdoms, to bring persecution, say, Babylon upon, you know, Jerusalem. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar knew what he was doing? That he was actually a tool in the hand of the Lord? No, of course not. And, and, and so I don't know that they're going to fully understand why they choose to do what they do necessarily. Right. Yeah, and there could be, you know, logistical reasons why they chose it. It could have to do with, uh, you know, access uh, to material. Large population. Yeah, they just want a big city, but... You know they want well not i mean i mean it's a large population of muslims in oh, nashville oh actually. a large population of muslims okay so i mean and i mean not that that makes it necessarily i'm not trying to you know say there's a bunch of muslims so it makes it more dangerous but i'm just saying no but there's yeah i understand what you're saying and and of course practicality you know from a, a muslim point of view it could be well if they are muslims they're just going to be you know martyrs and you know for the cause mm -hmm. so um, well, I also wanted to address something else. I, I looked up that vision, manuscript 152, 1904. Yeah. And it says, there was a scene presented to me. It was the night before the Sabbath. Yeah. So we that is when the scene was presented. Right. I looked out of the window and there was an immense ball of fire in the singular that mm -hmm. had come from heaven. And it fell where they were casting buildings with pillars, right. and especially the pillars were presented to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where Jeff made the tie-in. You know, the Parthenon Temple is under construction right now. Yeah, yes, though, uh, yes, so it's under construction, but they're not casting pillars. The thing that's interesting is that they did rebuild the Parthenon, and when they cast the pillars, they cast them there on site. They didn't cast them somewhere else and bring them. And the idea is that, uh -huh. they, that these, the pillars were cast there. Uh, which and is it also a, says, it also says, and it seemed as if the ball came right to the building and crushed it. Yeah. So it's like specific to this building with these casted pillars. Right. Um, and they saw that it was branching out and branching out and enlarging and began. Yeah. So, I mean, it, sounds it, like it seems as if, yeah, and it sounds like, you know, this could definitely be the same place as the other vision. Uh, well, the other build, vision has balls of fire, not a ball. Uh, well, in, in, in manuscript 188, 1905, it says, when I was at Nashville, I had been right, speaking so to the people. Right, so that's the yes. same vision is all I'm saying. The other vision is the August uh, 24th, 1906 vision. So she does mention the Nashville vision uh, at different well, times. So one's in 1905 yeah. and one's in 1904. Is, yeah, so but there's the two different vision. It's just that she's just, she's just giving an account of it at a different time, but it's still the Nashville yes. vision. There's only one yeah, Nashville yeah. vision, right? Yes, okay, I didn't understand what you were saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. She elaborates on it in different places, but it's the same vision, right. yeah. Yeah, so there's the one in Nashville and then there's the other ones. And I didn't realize that the other one was a separate vision or that it was, you know, maybe talking about different locations because in that one, she doesn't know where she is. Right. I think there's one that seems to infer that she's in LA. Well, she's in California. She's not in LA. I can't remember where she is. Well, she's overlooking the Salinas Valley, I think. And, and basically you're looking at the, the LA basin is where she would have been looking over. Okay. Basically. okay. Yeah. I don't know California. So. Um, yeah. So anyway, you know, when we look at these visions, you know, as you're saying, there's a lot of detail in there 
uh, that we need to pay attention to. And I, and I didn't go through the visions in detail and talk about each of the details. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know in some of the, the visions when she talks about is this flash of light that starts buildings on fire. But on mm. this one here, you know, it hits the building, right? So this very specific building has to be the Parthenon. And, and lots of people have come to that conclusion, not just mm -hmm. us, that it's the mm -hmm. Parthenon that's going to be hit um, with a fireball. Now, many people interpret it as a meteor. Um, and, you know, so there's, there's some speculation by one person that there's actually going to be a meteor and a nuclear explosion at the same time, which I think is a little, little hard to believe, but he, he believes it. Um, and that, that's, that uh, they're going to minimize that it's God's judgment by the fact that there's also a nuclear device that goes off at the same time. But that doesn't really make much sense to me. But, you know, he, he's going to actually have a chance to present some of his ideas. Um, and that's Chuck. So he's going to have an opportunity to to do that um, because I think we should look at everything. You know, we should look at the different possibilities and try to understand these things, even if they seem a bit outlandish. Cause I know our stuff seems a bit outlandish at times, even to us, you know, what we're saying. So um, I don't really have much more to say about it. I mean, obviously we could go on and talk about it. Um, anybody else with some comments about it, about Nashville? Now the the coordinates, any of these types of things, if you have any questions on that. Not really. Okay. So it's all pretty clear with everything that I presented. There's nothing that no no anybody needs cleared up. I know it's not a comprehensive study on Nashville, but uh Okay, so um, now I, I just have a question. So it's not related to Nashville. Uh, when it comes to uh, the study that Stephen and I did, has, has anybody looked at it uh, dealing with the minutes? Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, then you would have studied it. Uh, that the minutes have this same ratio as the days. Has anybody looked at that? Have any thoughts on that? I don't know if anybody's really looked it into it in too much detail. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Where was it presented? I don't, I don't think I saw it, it. It wasn't presented. I sent an email. So it's Stephen found some stuff that was really interesting dealing with the 391 years and the divisions of that time and how the minutes and the days show the same uh, That's numbers. The, the, the division of 12, is that how you, the one right. you're talking about? Yeah, so just a simple thing on that is that when you take 391 years, it's 40, uh, 4,836 months, actual months, you know, sidere, science, uh, uh, synodic months, right? So the months that you actually observe if you're observing the moon. and Based on what I, what I do is I take these number of months and I use the, the length of the month that they had in ancient times, which is very close to what we have. It's, it's only one, like, in, I think it's in the sixth decimal that they start to diverge. So very, very close. But we take that number of time, the number of days, and when we divide them into 12, we get 11,900 days. And... And I used to just always say it was 20 hours, but it's actually 19 hours and 50 minutes, right? And so this I didn't realize was significant. Now, if, and the exactness that this goes to, if you, if you work this out, it's 19 hours, 15 minutes, and 14.8704 seconds. So it's only 14 seconds and, and, almost 15 seconds, which is extremely precise when you're dealing with this large number of days and you're dividing it and breaking it down into something like this. Now, what we had noticed is that 144,000 days 
and 142,810 days. So that is the number of days that I use to divide uh, this number from. So that's, if you multiply this by 12, you end up with uh, this number. Now the difference between this, and if I take this and divide it by 12. Can I you explain 12. that again? Okay, so what we did, I'm just gonna draw this up here. So I'm gonna erase this. So when we take this 391 years, because I use this 144,000 days and the 142,000, so this is July 27th, 1449, and this is uh, July 27th, 1840. So this is 391 years, but that's 142,810 days. And if I go 144,000 days, which comes from the Mayan calendar, but also it's a significant number, and I count uh, the difference between 144,000, here I'll put it above, and 142,810. I remember now. Right, yeah. is, is this many days, nine, uh, uh, 1,190 days. So it's one tenth of this uh, one twelfth, right? So it's one tenth of one twelfth of this period, right? So we have this period of time, and this is going to be one tenth of that. So that was extremely unlikely to occur. But we also know that if we take 12,000 days and we subtract, so we've divided the 144,000 into, into 12. We're going to have 12,000 days, right? 12 times 12,000 is 144,000. And I subtract this. This is 900, 11,900. This is 100 days uh, different, right? But 100 days is 144,000 minutes, right? So when the church did 100 days of prayer, starting on March 27th in the center of the Levitical chiasm, and they're going to end tomorrow, that's 144,000 minutes of prayer. So whether they thought about it or not, I doubt they did, but that's what, how many days they chose to have in 100 days of prayer, how many minutes that that would cover. Now, the difference between 144,000 minutes that is, if I take this period of time here, this period of time here is 142,810 minutes. Because of this 19 hours and 50 minutes, if I subtract, if I put this into a period of time, just like uh, let me see. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm not doing that right. I, I, I know I was. I knew I was going to explain it wrong. It's not that many minutes. What it is is the difference is is a hundred a hundred and forty four thousand minutes, but it's subtracting this right because I, I had a hundred and forty a hundred days, but I yes. have to take off this period of time. And this period of time, nineteen hours and fifty minutes, is one thousand one hundred and ninety minutes right so the minutes and the days match and that is so crazy it's like impossible because we we have this this cycle of of you know the moon and we have the cycle of days and those are things that are natural but the fact that we have minutes is an arbitrary choice of man but the fact that the minutes match in such a precise way is insane. So, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how to present this properly. I, I didn't do a good job this time, but I'm, I'm going to be. No, that, that made sense. Okay, good. But I want to do it simpler and, and sometimes I have to present things the wrong way a few times before I figure out the simplest way to present it. I, um, I couldn't quite follow along. You didn't? No. Okay, so I'll explain it again. I'm going to, I'm going to do this all differently. 
we have 142,810 days. That is 391 years. Now, 391 years is, is um, if we divide it by 12. So, yeah. if make, so if I make 12 divisions here, you know, 1 to 12, and I, I, I take this 391 and I divide it by 12, I get 391 months. So that's the first thing. Each of these divisions, I divided 391 years by 12, I'm going to get 391 months, right? That just makes sense because there's 12 months in a year. But 391 months is 11,900 days. And if you take the actual months, the way that they work out is a month is 29.530 five eight seven days long i think it would help if you put a d for days then i could follow better like when it's a day or a month maybe put an m for a month or something okay so this is these are days this is a year these are days right this is a month is this many days one month equals that many days and in this period of time the 391 months in each of these 12s now these are our hour months, but if I go to the lunar months, there would actually be 403 because our month is longer. So I, I kind of left that detail out. But if I look at this whole period of time on the Islamic calendar, which uses a lunar calendar, or if you just count the months, it's 4,836 4, months, okay? And if I multiply months by this, I will get, 142,809 days and 22 hours. Okay, so that's the amount of time. It's not actually 142,810 days. It's 142,809 days and 22 hours. So that's just being more precise than I used to be, right? I would just say it's this many days, but now I'm being very precise. But it's still this many days, right? Now I take this and I divide it by 12. And when I do that, I get 11,900 days, 19 hours, and 50 minutes. Right? So that's how long 391 uh, months is. Of course, it's 403 actual months of lunar months, not months. Hey, I have it. A really dumb question. I'm yeah. gonna feel dumb saying it, but okay. I'm gonna ask. I'm confused how the 391 is 12 times. Because I mean, oh. there's 12 months in a year. I get that, but why would it be 391 12 times? Well, all I did is I divided 391. The reason why it's this 12 times is the the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar. And it aligns with our calendar every uh, 1,000 or 11,900 days and uh, 19 hours and 50 minutes. Okay. Okay. So every 32 years and seven months, our calendar comes, the, the Islamic calendar, you know, they have uh, like Ramadan. Ramadan mm -hmm. goes around the cycle every 32 years and seven months on our calendar. The Islamic calendar covers 33 years and seven months. They have a, a month, their month is, is 12 months of the year, but their month is this long, where our month is, is longer. Our month is 30, 33, or 30.44 30 days, and their month is 29.53 days. <clears throat> I can follow that. Okay. So, so that's why I got this number. So I kind of skipped that step. So then I know that there's, there's 12 cycles of these that occur in 391 years. Okay. This cycle doesn't just match up on 32 years and seven months. It actually lines up on the year itself. So whatever date this is here, this is going to be like the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. And it's going to be the 27th day of the, I can't remember. I think it's the 10th month 
Um, so they're like a day off, but that's just because their calendar is a little bit different how they started it. But anyway, the point is when you go through here, all these three calendars align again here, the solar, the biblical, and the Islamic. So this cycle of 391 years, which is a day, a month, and a year in prophetic time, is a natural cycle that occurs in the heavens. It's called the cycle of the ecliptic. And that if you look at uh, lunar eclipses, and you started here on July 27, 1449, and you watched all the lunar eclipses and kept track of them, when you get to July 27th, 1840, you're going to have the same lunar eclipses occur again for the next 391 years. Okay. So, but this cycle here, 11,900 days, 19 hours and 50 minutes, is the relationship between the lunar year and the solar year. And we have 12 of those that occur in this larger cycle. So that we have two different cycles. So I didn't arbitrarily pick it. Now, when we count 391 uh, months on our calendar, they're going to have 12 months extra because they have a whole extra year. So they have 403 months. And if you add up 403 times 12, it's going to give you this many lunar months. And that number of lunar months is 142,810 days, or more precisely, it's going to be 142,009 days and 22 hours, right? So you can see it's, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's short, but the fact that it's 22 hours short, when you divide this into half, when you divide 22 hours um, and, and, and these number of days, you're gonna get 11,900 days and 19 hours and 50 minutes. And 19 hours and 50 minutes is 11,100, and 90 minutes. So it's this number is one tenth of this number, but there is no natural relationship between the number of days and the number of minutes. That's something that's arbitrary. It's created by man. And yet, if I take this 144,000 days, which I get from the Muslim calendar, or not from, from the uh, Mayan calendar, and I divide this into cycles of 12, those cycles of 12 are going to be 12,000 days. The difference is going to be 100 days, but it's going to be 100 days, which is 144,000 minutes, but it's going to be 100 days minus 9 hours and 50 minutes, and 9 hours and 50 minutes is 1,190 minutes. And so, that means it's going to be 142,810 minutes difference between the two. Hmm. So this number is the same as this number. This is crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> right. It, it's just impossible. Like now, now we use this. I did a study, uh, one of the morning studies where I went through this because this is how we got July 10th, 2020 was using this cycle here and this cycle here. And so I'm not going to go through that study now, but it was in doing that study that we found this detail because Stephen said 100 days is 144,000 minutes. And then he wanted to know precisely how long this period was. And I said it was 19 hours and 50 minutes. Or I said it was 20 hours. And he said, too bad it's not 19 hours and 50 minutes. And I said, why? And he said, well, because then we would have this work out. And I said, well, it is 19 hours and 50 minutes, it's just 14 more seconds. But that's close enough for me. 19 hours, 50 minutes, and 14 seconds is close enough to 19 hours and 50 minutes. When you're dealing with such large numbers and you're dividing them, because this, this, this decimal, as you refine it, it actually gets closer to 19 hours and 50 minutes, the more you refine the decimal. So if I added another decimal place to this, I would actually have a six. If, if you were going to refine it, but the Jews didn't refine it that much, you would go six, six at the end. And that would make it exactly 19 hours and 50 minutes. I think I actually have to add a two and a three or something after that. Uh, but, you know, it's once you get to this number of decimal places, then you're being extremely precise, way more precise than you could possibly imagine that we could even come close to doing something like this. I've dealt with a lot of astronomical numbers. 
you don't get this type of precision ever in something that's so unrelated uh, to each other. Um, so anyway, that's my study on that. <laughs> so uh, I want you, you people to pray, um, you know, because I have a friend coming over tomorrow at 9 a.m. who uh, you know, wants to study this stuff. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, he's not an Adventist. And, uh, but, you know, he's seen the website. He knows about the prediction. He wants to know about it. And there's lots of other people that, uh, um, you know, it can make a real difference in their life if they can open up their heart to God. Because just because something happens doesn't mean people are going to accept that we were right. You know, I think there's lots of scenarios that we could come up with that people could say, well, this was just, you know, people choosing to do it on that day, or we had something to do with it or some kind of connection. You know, who knows what the news is going to come up with. But anyway, this kind of stuff, this objective numbers are just crazy to me. So anyway, hopefully that's, uh, that's good enough for tonight for everyone. I'm going to ask if when yeah. you pray, Theodore, if you could pray for Larry, because he's been sick. Okay. Um, Angela always has interesting comments. You can read her comment there about Samson and the pillars. I think there's lots of significances in things that we're going to know more about as time goes on. But anyway, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the Sabbath hours that are coming. And uh, we're thankful for the light that you've been shining on our paths. And we ask that we can have strength to walk in that light. We pray uh, for Larry. We pray for others, Lord, who are sick. Um, and we're thankful for the health that you do give us. Um, we ask, Lord, that also uh, um, that my friend and others who have been talking to me, and I know that ev everybody's uh, starting to have opportunities to share. We pray, Lord, that you can give us wisdom in dealing with, with souls and uh, that the people who are looking for light, they can receive it. I pray for uh, the work and the writing I've been doing online. Um, uh, and we ask, Lord, that uh, these people can have their hearts open to, to truth and that many people who are maybe skeptical once the event occurs uh, will see the, be uh, meek enough to recognize that they were wrong. Uh, thank you for hearing our prayer and thank you for the time that we had to study here. And we ask that uh, our studies throughout this Sabbath and, and the next couple of weeks uh, can be led and guided by you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. I'm just going to stop the recording here.